Welcome to the final regular season edition of A Closer Look. I'm Mark Shine. This is Mark Miller, the playoff edition coming up next week. But before we get to that, we were at Versailles last week, and you led a Normandy-type beach assault on the concession stand at Versailles, and your report is? I was hungry. Yeah, it, was, it was good. Yeah. It was good. Loaded fries, melted cheese, bacon on fries, and they had vinegar, too. They were great. They were great. Yeah. But we did find one negative at the Versailles concession stand. <laughs> No Kit Kat bars. No, no Kit Kat bars. All right. Well, you know, we try to be a public service here at uh, A Closer Look, and we have found out that some people refer to these as fun size. Yeah. This is not a fun size candy bar. Now, Kit Kat bars, they refer to these as snack size. That's honest. Yes. We yeah. have decided this right here, it says king size, should not say king size. This should say fun size uh, candy bar. There's a lot of fun wrapped up there, in there. There's a lot yeah. of fun in that. And, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's rivalry week, but it I, is. I, I have a hard time disagreeing with anything you just said. I think Kit Kats are, as my grandson would say, they are delicious. There you go. And it is rivalry week. We're going to get back to that a little bit later on when we get into some of our nuts and bolts of a closer look. But before we do that, uh, we want to kind of look at last week's games mm -hmm. and what happened a week ago. And I'm going to start this one off. We're going to look at the Wapak St. Mary's game and what a game that was in the Western Buckeye League. We know the Western Buckeye League is in kind of their end of season tournament. Both teams were very good defensively throughout the football game. Uh, St. Mary's, of course, came in. Uh, they have been low rushing all year, was 273. Wapak gave them 161 on the ground. Their previous low points were 30 against Salina. They had just 13 in this one. Great football game if you like defense. On the other side, how good was the St. Mary's defense? Uh, they gave up just 48 yards on the ground to a Wapak team that had been rushing the ball very well all year long, 110 total yards. Wapak had been over 30 points six times on the season, just seven points in this game for them. That was a Manny Voorhees pass uh, to chase uh, Childs in the end zone. We're going to come back to this play a little bit later on, Mark, when we get into our mm -hmm. highlight plays of the week. But what happened is two field goals. And last week when I was here, I said, you know what, the advantage might well lie with Wapak yeah. and Tristan Meyer, the field goal kicker He's from Wapak. He's good. Yeah. But instead, Gabe Vanderveer makes two field goals for St. Mary's, and they win the football game 13-7 and put themselves in a great spot in the Western Buckeye League. Hey, another game that we thought was going to be a great game like that and come down to a, a score one way or the other was in the MAC Conference. Two of the three teams with just one loss got together, Marion Local and St. Henry. This ended up being lopsided, 31 to nothing, Marion Local. Check out the defense for Marion Local. They gave up two first downs and 23 total yards to a St. Henry team that was playing very well. We had just done them previously. That's the fifth shutout of this regular season. So they shut out half the teams they played, and that is their fourth shutout in a row. Talk about playing well when you're getting ready for the playoffs. Offensively, they had 400 total yards. Marion Local now 8-1, 6-1 in the league, still up there with Coldwater with just one loss. St. Henry falls to 5-2, still looking to get into the playoffs. Another huge game in the Western Buckeye League game. This turned out to be a shootout. Ottawa, Glendorf, and Elida goes double overtime. It looks like OG's in a great spot there, up 28-14, heading into the fourth quarter. Isaac McAdams with a couple of touchdown passes in the fourth quarter to tie the game at 28 as we head to overtime. McAdams scores on a touchdown pass to Cole Harmon, but uh, Kaufman answers with a touchdown pass to Trent Basinger. We go to overtime number two. Daniel Beamer scores on a two-yard run. Wapak holds Elida off uh, in the final part of the, or excuse me, OG holds um, Elida off in the final uh, drive of the game. And uh, OG wins 42-35 in overtime. McAdams threw for uh, what, 23 of 41, threw for four touchdowns. That's 10 touchdown passes in the last two games for Isaac. But what about the game for quarterback Jay Kaufman from Ottawa Glendorf? He rushed for 296 yards, three scores, threw for two more scores, had 410 yards in total offense, sets up a big game this week with OG and St. Mary's. Hey, let's go to the NWCC. USV and Fort Lormie, again, just one loss for each team. First place at stake, playoffs certainly. USV put up 50, 50 points at Fort Lormie's 29 at Fort Lormie. USV had 551 total yards. Austin Sloan, you've heard us saying his name almost every week since he got healthy and came back to play. 264 yards, four touchdowns, only one of eight PAT conversions for USV. And that's a kick, a couple of runs, several passes, only one of eight successful. That's huge and could bite him in a close game. USV now 5-1, and one, still in the hunt. Fort Lormie 4-2 and two. at 4-5. and five, They're on the outside looking in for the playoffs. 
Okay, let's move into our uh, highlight plays of the week. We chose two of them this week, mm -hmm. Mark, and one, obviously, from each of the big games. We have, let's take a look at what happens in St. Mary's, first of all. All right, here we go. This is just before half. I think just a, like 10 seconds or something and left in the first half. You can see that St. Mary's has a ball outside to 30, a handoff and another handoff. So it's going to be a reverse. No, he's going to stop and throw it into the end zone, a beautiful left-handed throw. Now take a look at it in slow motion. Here's the handoff. That's Eric Spicer. He gives it back to Julius Fisher. Now Julius rolled to his right, but he's left-handed. Kind of the opposite of what you try to do, but boy, it worked like a charm. Into the end zone, Seth Warnham, it, touchdown. That was huge for momentum, got him into the locker room. And before we get to our next play, Mark, that all the offensive linemen stayed on side. It was a well-executed yeah. play. and They really something. sold it. They pulled oh, two they linemen did. that way. Just the quarterback and one uh, tackle that kind of got out and made sure that he got contained. Well-designed play. Worked beautifully. Well, and, of course, Doug Fry, not Mr. Trickery usually. Mm -hmm. You know, they line up and knock you off the mm -hmm. ball. But it was a great time to do it in that particular yep. sequence of the game. Let's go then to that uh, Indian Lake Bell Fountain game for our next play. All right. You can see the field's not in great shape, but... Here's one of our favorite guys. We saw him early in the, se the season, number two, Alex Jacobs. He's the returning player of the year in that conference, and he had a great game. 205 yards rushing. This is a 64-yard touchdown run. Ran it for four. Look at the guys pulling. They seal. They kick out. There's the avenue. He gets up in there. Look at the receiver. Still working. All you got to do is get in his way because Alex Jacobs has speed. Nobody's going to touch him now. All the way down the sideline. I said he had four touchdowns rushing. He also threw the ball for another touchdown. He is a player and ready for the playoffs. All right, Mark, thank you for doing that. We thought we would take a look in our uh, question mark season sequence tonight about where everybody's headed playoff-wise. And what we've done is we've tried to synthesize things which come from two of our favorite sources, Joe Itell and what's called the Fantastic 50. Now, that doesn't mean everything we're going to show you is dead flat, 100% accurate, but it's kind of a hybrid of what uh, two different uh, sources think is going to happen playoff-wise and where we stand. So we're going to put some things up on the screen here and just kind of scroll through them quickly as we look at each of the regions in our area and what's going on. First of all, um, this is the uh, Division 1, 2, 3 stuff. Um, you can see here that both Finley and Lima Senior need to win pretty much to get in. Lima Senior, of course, Mark, they play Toledo Central Catholic. Finley plays Ross, and Lima Senior with a very, very difficult uh, challenge to go play a number one yeah. team in the state. The number one Finley team with Ross, a little bit better yeah. chance. Yeah, Walpock St. Mary's in. Here's the next couple of divisions. Go ahead, Mark, lead it through. Well, look, if you look at Ottawa Glendorf, of course, they're going to play uh, um, St. Mary's this week. Yep. They're probably in. If they win this week, they get a home game. Indian Lake, whom we just had a moment ago, and there's a 69% chance of them playing at home if they get a win. We just saw that field. That may not be the best place to host right. a, a playoff game in, right. Mark. And, of course, Coldwater, um, they're right now number two in their region. They have clinched a home game already with the game coming up this week. As you look down through a little bit, Liberty Benton uh, upset last week by Hopewell Loudon. They need to win this week and get some help. So yeah, and they're playing Anna. Macomb, too. They're that's playing a tough Macomb, one. yeah. That's, yeah. And that's why if they win, they have a better chance of getting, obviously, get lots, lots of, of points, points there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Anna, of course, has a game this week uh, that they are have, to, have to win as well and need a little bit of help to get in. Anna has Minster this week, and we saw how well they're playing. Versailles, just a very, very small chance for them to get in, partly because they play New Bremen and not a lot of points there for them to pick up. So still alive and kicking, but not a great chance for the Versailles uh, Tigers to get in. As we go on then to our next batch, this is uh, Division 6, regions 22 and 24. Um, as we go through that, we see Marion Local and uh, Jefferson Spencer. Obviously, they're going to play each other this week. Both of those teams, all three of those teams, probably at home. St. Henry appears to be in. And then Allen East, Mark, that's mm -hmm. a big game. They have Ada this week, and that's a huge game for them. They'll get a lot of points if they win that one. Of course, Ada looking to win and get a better playoff spot. And you know when you're uh, Allen East setting over there, you're going, okay, it's win, or we're not going to go into the next week. Most likely, they would need a lot of help if they lose. Van Buren, who lost their quarterback due to injury two weeks ago, they're still hanging in there, but they need a lot of help to get in and, of course, a win this week. And then finally, as we go to Division 7, Region 26, there's McComb with that home game. Lipsick is in. They're going to get a home game with a win. So will Crestview. So will Arlington. How about Joe Kirkendall back at Lipsick? Immediately that? into the playoffs again. And yeah. what's interesting about that is Lipsick plays Arlington this week. One of those two teams is going mm -hmm. to get a home game. Uh, obviously, a lot of computer points to pick up there. The other one is, is probably in anyway, but uh, needs a lot of uh, a chance to win to get a home game. And then there's Delphi St. John's. Well, if they win, this is kind of like the Alanis scenario. Delphi St. John's makes the playoff. Who do they have to beat? 
the Coldwater Cavaliers. Yeah, yeah and tough, so tough order. It, it's a monumental task, obviously, for St. John's to see if they can rise up and then get themselves into the playoffs uh, with a win right there. So, and one more, Division 7, Region 28. And you can see Minster, of course, we saw last week playing very well. Fort Recovery, defending state champion. They're going to have a chance to get in. There's Layman Catholic. They're sitting there. Uh, they win. They get a home game. We just mentioned Ada a moment ago. Most probably in at Ada. Most probably a home game, uh, even if they would lose. And then Upper Soda Valley. They what have a year never, they're having. They absolutely. Yeah. Never made the playoffs at Upper Soda Valley. If the win, they have a 100% chance of getting in, says the computer. They play Ridgemont this week. And then Riverside down at the bottom, just a small chance for the Riverside Pirates to get in. They play hard northern this week. But how about Josh Spencer and the USC? Yeah, yeah great year. And, and how lucky are we to have this many teams playing Absolutely. on the last week of the season for a chance to go to the playoffs? And that's why you want to come back next week to a closer yeah, look. And we'll see we'll who's sort in. sort it all out and who's that's going right. where. We'll also have our broadcast schedule of playoff games next week for you as well. Okay, Mark, it is now time for our, uh, our spotlight player, kind of the where are they at now type thing. And you've got a good one. Well, let's look at Joel Penton. Everybody remembers big Joel from Van Wert. He graduated over there in 03. In wrestling as a junior, he ended up third in the state. Did not wrestle as a senior. He turned it on into football, and, and that worked for him, too. He was a Division III co-defensive player of the year. And that's saying something because his junior year, he was a defensive lineman. As a senior, they made him a linebacker, and he still made player of the year. So pretty good there. Went on to Ohio State, of course, a member of three uh, Big Ten championships and one national championship in 07. He was a four-time academic All-Big Ten player, so uh, lots of up top, not just a big body, but an awfully good student as well. He won the Humanitarian uh, Heisman Award. That's the Werfel Award, Werfel Trophy, named after Danny Werfel, the, the player that mm -hmm. used to be at, at Florida, uh, and that, that's, that's quite an honor to get. He now runs Stand for Truth Ministry. And over the last several years, he has spoken to over 500,000 high school students. He's spoken around here, comes back a lot to this area. He's spoken at our FCA Spring mm -hmm. Banquet. He is a great speaker, a great role model. He has wife Bethany, children, Joel, Judah, Luther, Vera, and question mark, because they're <laughs> expecting one soon. So they'll have five children soon. Joel Penton, and, and you've got a comment on Joel, not just well, this stuff, but something more important he's done for our area. Yeah, he did. Before there was an FCA in our area, we, we tried multiple times. Joel, as a student at Van Wert, decided he was going to get an FCA chapter at every school in the Western Buckeye League, mm -hmm. and as a high school student, got that accomplished. Yeah. That's quite a and, and lined up the, the teams to pray after the games and started the volleyball overnighter that still goes yes. today. Right. Uh, and that's a high school student got more done than us old geezers did for years and years. <laughs> it is rivalry week. We, Mark and I mentioned that a moment ago. We're going to uh, cover the Elida uh, rivalry with Bath a little bit later on in our show today. Yeah, we got Banks and Feller, you know. Okay, I'm not a Cub fan. I'm a Ernie Banks fan. Yeah, not a Cub well, fan. Mr. But, Cub. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Cub. There we well, go. Well, we, we picked the two famous yeah. guys from each fan. Let's play two today. Yeah. Okay. Well, what makes up a great rivalry? Yeah. We thought we'd kind of go through some of the things. You've yeah. got some thoughts about what makes up a great rivalry. Well, I think a lot of times close proximity. Yeah. You know, in high school, it's kind of backdoor neighbors. College, maybe down the road a little bit. Even uh, in, in the pros, you know, in the same division. But I think a lot, of, if, if you're close together, you know each other, you see each other on the street, that makes for a good rivalry. It does. It does. Yeah. I, proximity is sort of thing. And you've got to be good, right? Oh, yeah. You've got to be competitive. Yeah. And to, to pick on a team, the Browns and Steelers used to be a rivalry. It's not anymore. It's not anymore because one yeah. team doesn't hold up right. under the, under the right. bargain. So yeah. you want both teams to be good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, if you look at the over the time and the win-loss record is pretty close to 500, that makes for a good rivalry. You know, yeah. a lot of times it's, it's for supremacy in your league. You know, maybe the two teams are always battling it out in your league. For, in the Big Ten for years and years, it was Ohio State, Michigan. Right. They were one, two. Same way in the college uh, ranks. You know, uh, for the state, it could be Michigan State and, right. and the University of Michigan. Auburn, Alabama's crazy down there for Alabama supremacy. I think that helps make a rivalry. Great players, great coaches, Absolutely. coaches that are together for a oh, long time, coaching uh -huh. against each other. Bo and Woody. You know, they wrote a book about that thing. Yes. You know, what a rivalry yeah. that was. You've done some research on Ohio rivalries. Yeah, yeah I found a survey that they did uh, several years ago, and they ranked them from one to four. That's, that's the one. I cut it off there because there's just a spent smattering of votes after that. But the number one rivalry, according to this, is one that we'd probably all think of. It's Canton, McKinley, and Maslin. In Stark County, Ohio, they started playing in 1894. They've played 113 times. It is the only high school game in America that has betting odds in right. Las Vegas. 
And uh, you can name, you know, Spielman and all the greats that have played at either of those places. And having grown up in that county, th that is crazy. It's crazy. It's a sellout. Uh, it doesn't matter what the record is. Uh, that's another thing that makes a great rivalry, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, do you just show up when they're both 9-0, and or do you show up when they're having an off year and this rivalry shows up every year? Yeah. When, when it's snowing outside, it's week 10 and you're both 2-7, and seven. And the people are there. and the, They still and, show up. They still, that's a big Piqua thing. Troy was number two. Number three is Cleveland St. Ignatius and Cleveland, or Lakewood St. Edwards. And I looked at that just a little bit. Between the two of them, they've been in the playoffs 47 times and have won 14 yeah. state championships. So that's a good rivalry. And then a local one, Coldwater St. Henry was number four. Now, this is several years ago. I'd say if they do it again, the survey right. might say it's Coldwater Marion Local right. because of their state prowess, you know, in the playoffs. But those are the top four Ohio high school rivalries, according to this survey. I really like what the Northwest Conference does, because mm -hmm. in Week 10, they make sure they have a rivalry game. Obviously, we've got Spencerville and Delphus. We're going to talk yeah. about that in just a moment. But then you have Crestview plays Paulding, uh, Ada plays Allen East, and Bluffton plays Grove. I think that's a great that's way great. to do it. Yeah. That, that certainly yeah. is a good thing. Some, um, some leagues can't do that. That's though. right. And it's very, who would we do it in the Western Buckeye League? Yeah. How, how would you do it in, in the MAC yeah. and so on? But yeah. you've also looked at some college rivalries. Yeah. And I think maybe we have a graphic. The five oldest rivalries. They've played it the longest. Right there. Number one, Lehigh and Lafayette have played 152 times. They call their game the rivalry. That makes sense, huh? They've played continuously since 1897. They're only 17 miles apart. Number two at 138, Yale versus Princeton. Number three at 132 is the Harvard Yale. They call that the game. And I know Ohio State Michigan fans like to call that the game, but this game lasted. You know, it started in 1875. They only stopped for both world wars, and it's very close. It's known for pranks. You know, a lot of people probably remember uh, the Yale students uh, infiltrating the Harvard uh, section and having them hold up placards that said, we suck, halfway through the game. That made uh, ESPN. Uh, they have sellouts. Now, these, the, the Ivy League, and having been to several of these games, they get 12, 15,000 people for a game. But when it comes to Harvard and Yale, again, records are out the window. It doesn't matter. Harvard sells out their 30,000 seat stadium. Yale sells out the Yale Bowl at 64,000 every single year. Number four, 125 games, Minnesota, Wisconsin, a Big Ten game. They play for the Paul Bunyan's Axe. And then Ohio, uh, or Miami of Ohio and Cincinnati, they play for the Victory Bell, and they've done that 121 times. Other great rivalries that we can all think yeah. of. We all have our favorites. Sure. Army, Army, Navy, yeah. uh, OSU, Ohio State. Uh, there, there are some great. Obviously, it was a go around the country. It's Florida, Florida State, and, and all those types of things. Here's a couple of cool uh, okay. ones. Okay, West Virginia, Pittsburgh. They play. They call it the backyard brawl. They stopped playing a year ago because of conference realignments. Yeah. Isn't that a shame? That's a shame. A great yeah. rivalry played out over a hundred times. They're never. They're not going to do it anymore. Here's my favorite though. Georgia, Georgia Tech. They call their game clean, old-fashioned hate. Hate. That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> that's right. a good one. Well, one thing about our rivalry is when we're done with it, we're going to shake hands and say congratulations to the winner. Let's go through a few games quickly that we have here, and I think you're going to start this one out when, uh, with Spencerville and Jefferson. Spencerville and Jefferson, NWC championship, and they've played the last game the last several years, uh, both coming off wins. This is going to be a ball control game. Both coaches, Summers and Zerby, want to control that ball, keep it on the ground, not turn it over, not make mistakes. Jefferson has won the last four meetings between these schools. They played twice last year because they played week 10 and week one of the playoffs. They turned right around. They are also the three-time defending NWC champs. So the, the Jeff Cats have gotten the best of, of Spencerville the last few years, but they are right there again looking at 6-0 and records for both of them. The game starts at 7 o'clock. might be over at 8.30. <laughs> That's that, that, right. They both keep the ball on the ground. It'll go. All right, Ottawa, Glendorf, and St. Mary's. We know where St. Mary's is with their win last week. They're 9-0, and 8-0 in the conference play. Ottawa, Glendorf, 8-1, 7-1. OG has to win to share the championship. The best offense and def defense in the conference are at St. Mary's. The second best offense, third best defense is Ottawa Glendorf. Be a huge matchup this week. Rush defense for OG is important. They have held everybody in check on the ground except Wapak, who rushed for 327 against them, and it cost them a win. We know about Jay Kaufman. We know about Julius Fisher, Eric Spicer. Don't forget the quarterback, Dustin Howell. He's 20 of 25 with a 480 yards the last two weeks. Takes a lot of pressure off. Yeah. And the Bath Wildcats. Elida Bulldogs. The rivalry. They're rivalry. You and I. They are. Bath yeah. employ, Elida employ. This is a good game down through the years. It's better when they're both really good, and that hasn't been the case the last several years, but still they like playing each other. 
Um, you talk about Bath, I'll talk about Elijah. Well, if you just look at Bath, they have to run the football to win the, win the game. The games that they have won, Delphi St. John's, uh, Van Wert, Shawnee, they have outrushed their opponents. The games that Elida has lost, Salina, St. Mary's, Wapak, OG, they have been outrushed. Elida has been outrushed. Bath has to rush the football and keep a hot Isaac McAdams off the field with his offense. Isaac McAdams is very hot. They're coming off a two uh, overtime loss up at OG. They got to rebound, play week 10, playing a rival will get you out of that funk a little bit. The passing game is really rolling. As Mark said, they are five and four. So they're going for a winning record. They lose, it's five and five. That's not winning. It's not losing, but it's not winning. The home team has won the last three years of this game, this year's game at Elida. And we're getting the wrap it up signal from upstairs. So let's do our games of the week coming up this week. Spencerville, Jefferson, OG and St. Mary's where you and I will be at Liberty Benton, Macomb, Fort Recovery, St. Henry. We also have volleyball coming up this weekend too. Division three district final game coming up this weekend as well. Lots going on, soccer as well. You've been watching a closer look here on WOSN. Go Tribe. Yes, sir. Go Kit Kat bars. Go Kit Kat. And we just